and welcome to the Mime Cast. This is a chance for uh, fans of the Mime Troop and pretty much everyone else to kind of get to know us a little better. I mean, you know, you see us on stage, and you see people in the pit, or you hear about us, and uh, this is a chance for everybody to talk about what the rest of their life is like. You know, where are they from? Where were they born? What happened? All of these different stories that normally the audiences don't have a chance to hear. And so for today, we have Daniel Savio. How you doing, Daniel? I'm doing pretty well, Michael. How are you? Okay, so far. <laughs> Good. So, now, Daniel, you've been with the, uh, the Mime Troop for a few years, but there's other stuff that you do and other things that I'm, I'm curious about even. Like, um, but where, where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in San Francisco. Uh, really? Yeah, I was born in San Francisco um, at, uh, what is it, uh, I want to say General Hospital. Um, oh, the Zuckerberg I Hospital now? Probably would have to double check that with my mom, but I think that's what it was. And oh. uh, uh, we lived in the marina on Greenwich Street in between Van Ness and Filbert. Um, I know that area. Uh, up on the, the, the top floor, the third floor of a, a three-floor apartment building. So we had a view of the bridge, and uh, it, it was, yeah, it was actually a, you know, quite nice place for a uh, young family of pretty limited means. Um, uh, I think my, my father was teaching at San Francisco State, mm -hmm. and uh, my mom was working as a uh, licensed therapist, I believe. I that's what it was. Oh, really? Um, and, uh, and so we lived there, uh, uh, just, just above the marina, really, um, until I was about eight. Uh, and then we, we kind of moved around Northern California a little bit. Um, we spent a little bit of time in Modesto and, um, and then came to Sonoma County. Uh, and my mom still lives in Sonoma County, although we, we moved around the county a little bit as well. Hmm. So why did you guys move out of the city? Um, um, Mario got a job at Modesto Junior College. Oh, nice. Um, so, so that was, uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember, I mean, you know, I was a little kid, so I don't remember mm -hmm. exactly uh, what was the reason for leaving um, San Francisco State uh, University, but uh, I, I know that he got a job at Modesto Junior College. So we were we were living in Modesto Junior, excuse me, in Modesto uh, uh, when the uh, uh, Loma Prieta earthquake happened. Oh. Um, and uh, I was I was playing with some friend, uh, and my uh, my mother had gone into the Bay Area for some sort of uh, work thing, I don't remember. Um, so we were, and this was, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Bay Bridge collapsed. We didn't know right. uh, whether she would uh, be able to get home or, or where she was, but it, it, in fact, uh, it didn't actually affect her, I think. I don't, don't remember. Mm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, my, my dad was working at Modesto Junior College at the time, so. Hmm. So what was your father teaching? Oh, man, well, he taught a lot of different stuff, you know. Actually, he, um, he taught math and physics, and then once we moved to Sonoma County and he was working at Sonoma State University, uh, he taught uh, a couple of very interesting courses of his own design, um, Really? One on uh, the use of time as a storytelling device in literature and, and also television. So he actually used um, a couple of Star Trek episodes as examples in the class. Like you would, yeah. Like you would. Uh, but, but also uh, Mrs. Dalloway, uh, uh, mm. which although there's no actual time travel in it, it's told by sort of going back and forth in the memory of, of the, the person whom the story is about. Um, wow. uh, and I had no idea. He, he also invent while, while he was at uh, Sonoma State, he invented a new kind of syllogism, which I don't understand anything about, uh, uh, called an Aristotle Euler diagram, um, hmm. uh, which uh, got published 
uh, after he died. Oh, wow. I'll have to look for that. That's interesting. I suppose we should, um, you should uh, speak a little bit about your father, uh, just to give people some context. Right, right. Um, so my dad uh, is Mario Savio, who uh, came to public prominence in 1964 as a spokesperson for the free speech movement at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, he, uh, he's, he's famously quoted from uh, a couple of speeches he gave during that uh, movement, especially people refer to the bodies on the gears speech. Um, uh, and, when, and there's, there's some nice video of, of things like this too that you can check out. Um, uh, he didn't remain in public prominence. A lot of people would have liked for him to have continued as a career activist or, uh, or, or politician. Um, and he did run for, uh, I, I believe the California state legislature, uh, but he did not oh. win. Um, and, and I think that was, that was as far as he took it. He, he really needed for, uh, his personal mental health to, uh, retreat from public life, um, to, to a large extent. Uh, but, uh, he, uh, he did actually continue in activism, um, um, uh, after uh, after I had been born and, and grew up a little, so in, in the 90s when we were in Sonoma County and he was working at Sonoma State, he did become involved in some of the on-campus politics there. And also, uh, I think a little before that, in the, um, the fight against, oh, am I going to remember this correctly? Proposition 187. Mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, about keeping immigrant kids from being able to access the schools. Yeah, um, I think that's a number. So he, he was involved somewhat in the fight against that. Uh, uh, also in the 80s, and I know very little about this, my mom could, could fill in the, the details. He, he did have some involvement in the, uh, uh, what was it, the Nicaragua situation oh, um u.s out of central america yeah yeah I, I i don't remember precisely but I, I mean you know very you know minor involvement like he you know went on a march or something like that i don't i don't remember yeah. more than that well i just wanted to give some people a little bit of context but you know uh mainly want to talk about you you're a, you know you're a collective member with the san francisco mime troupe you're a writer a, a, a lyricist a composer uh you've worked with other other companies quite a bit um but i want to get back to your your like so you're like a teenager in modesto um <laughs> and when did you start uh start kind of gravitating towards music uh, well, I, I started in music at a very, very young age. We got uh, a piano in the house. And, you know, this is, I think, also a story having to do with my dad. I don't, I'll probably mess some something of this up. But there was, I think, a car accident that breaks on a, on a car that, that Mario was driving went out. And he navigated it through intersections and crashed it into a wall rather than, you know, killing, wow. killing people. Um, and I, I, I think maybe his arm was broken or something like that. I, I don't remember all of it. You know, this is from when I was a very young child, but I believe there was an insurance payout that got us a piano and maybe a dishwasher. I, you know, I, I, I don't remember exactly something like that. And um, wow. uh, so, so we had a piano uh, as I was growing up, and by the time I was seven, I think it, I think it was about seven, uh, I I was I started taking piano lessons, um, and uh, and I stayed in piano lessons uh, through the end of college. Um, oh. Uh, although the the nature of the lessons changed, at, you know, at, at first it was classical music focused and basic fundamentals focused, of course. 
And uh, then as a teenager, I took lessons with a, a, a teacher who introduced me to jazz harmony. Um, mm. and, uh, and then in college, it became, again, a little bit more classical music focused. But, but by then, I was also very interested in musical theater. Uh, um, I, I started to be into theater as an actor uh, right before high school. Um, oh, I didn't know you were an actor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I haven't done it in a long time. Um, hmm. uh, yeah, you know, I think I think a large part of my skill as an actor is was really just that I'm a pretty good reader. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I can I can, well, I can I can read something and and actually communicate some of the meaning of it, uh, which which you know that'll get you pretty far as an actor, but not all the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but, uh, in college, excuse me, in high school, uh, although I was acting, my interest in music was also really coming up. And, and so, um, I think that was when it really started to develop. Although, uh, that was also when my father died. And then there was sort of uh, a period of a few years of, I guess, psychological reconstruction, Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I, w when I think of my artist self, there's sort of like a before and middle and after period. Um, but uh, uh, it, it's essentially by the time I was in college or maybe sometime during college, I had transformed my thinking from, oh, I'm interested in acting, oh, I'm interested in music, to, oh, there's a thing that combines the two of those, and that's the thing that I'm interested in. Um, so mm. so uh, by the time I was through with college, I was pretty firmly interested in musical theater. Um, was there like a particular show you saw or something where you were like, ah, that's it, that's what well, I want to do? That's a good question. Um, Hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, several friends uh, uh, of, of mine um, and, and I put on a production of Hedvig and the Angry Inch uh, wow. while, we, while we were in school. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was very difficult. It was, it was very difficult both technically and also uh, personally. Um, uh, you know, conflicts and, you know, that is per personality conflicts, uh, uh, mm -hmm. having difficulty learning how to work with other people um, in stressful situations. Uh, pesky other people. Uh, well, no, I, I, I wish I could say it was the other people. But, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but there, there was that. But I, I wouldn't cite Hedvig and the Angry Inch as a show that, that grabbed me, like you're saying. Um, it, it, in high school, right after my dad died, as in we were in rehearsals for it when he died, uh, I put on a show um, w with our, our you know high school drama program called Quilt. Um, it, it's a mm. it's about the AIDS quilt, um, yeah. And it's it's a beautiful show. I think uh, it. it it's not structured like your typical musical. It's it's a series of vignettes that don't relate directly to one another, um, but are telling true stories or you know people's interpretations of their own stories um, uh, that that were that are uh, in the actual Names Project AIDS quilt. And, and being that that show was so, uh, you know, it, it, it is itself so deeply cathartic. Um, and so it served as a catharsis for me um, at, at the time. Uh, so, so maybe that's the show. It's a, it's a little hard to say. I was still an actor at the time, not really a musician. But still as a form of storytelling. Yes. To have musical theater, because I think the thing with, uh, you know, musical theater, it's like Shakespeare in that it really gives you a chance 
to expand upon emotional moments. That's what s the songs yeah. do. In the same way with Shakespeare, the <clears throat> you know the soliloquies are these peaks inside of somebody's yeah. head that you normally don't see in life unless you you know if you're walking down the street and somebody's talking to themselves really loudly. Normally, you don't listen. Uh, but you know, with with Shakespeare, you have these beautiful monologues, and people are telling you how they feel about everything in their life. And the same way thing with musicals, the way the songs work in, you know, as the song is a musical monologue yeah. uh, workshop that the Mind Troop teaches, um, the idea of this is a way to express pure emotion. Music for me is a way to express emotion uh, without all without words. I mean, the the words uh, can help explain it, but if you if somebody says to you what their favorite song is in in or <clears throat> their the favorite song to sing or to listen to, you get a better sense of them than if you're just talking to them. Sometimes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. People people say things like uh, music is a window to the soul or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's true, and and it's it's used uh, in in as you point out multiple art forms. Uh, you know, in in opera. You have the aria and the recitative, and, and the recitative is not usually that glimpse into people's inner world. That's, that's what the aria is. The, the recitative is more uh, just conversation. Although in modern musical theater, sometimes we, we seem to be crossing the two frequently, as, as frequently as possible, really, like in, in order to... Uh, in, in, in order to sort of have the the authentic uh, conversation, the, the realistic conversation, while simultaneously getting to see people's inner thoughts about that conversation. Um, right. And, and sometimes the inner thoughts, I think, it's like, it's not just the lyrics of the song, it's that character's theme, which is something we do with a lot of the mind troupe and all musical theater. Somebody comes in with a nice bouncy theme, we kind of identify that yeah. character. We go, oh, well, that's who they are, at least in that moment. And it, and it relates also to, like with Commedia, you know, a character comes in a certain way or in a melodrama, and we now know who that person is, at least in that moment, who they're presenting yeah. to us. Yeah. So even in a recitative, in, a, in an opera or in a regular musical, uh, the music that's underneath is telling us an emotional thing, an energy yeah. thing, that the words may or may not uh, might be specifically contradicting or, or uh, yeah. underlining. But the music... And by the... having a, so, a, uh, a strong, uh, easily identifiable theme for a character, you can then manipulate that theme in different ways so that you're revealing different emotions but still tying them back to the same character. Yeah, yeah. And having different themes clash with other themes in a way, or oh, how they overlap, how do these lovers' yeah. themes start to meld into each other, or where do we find the differences? Yeah. So when did you start shifting, thinking, uh, well, maybe I should write Oh, music. um... Well, I, I already was writing music a little bit, uh, even even when I was very young, um, uh, mm -hmm. as 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 early as like nine years old, maybe. Um, oh, but wow. but I didn't go very deep into it. I you know a little bit here, a little bit there, uh, and then I, I tried a little bit more in high school. Um, I was in a couple of bands where where we tried out different songs. Uh, uh, but as far as writing music for the theater, uh, I, I didn't get into that until later, until after, uh, after college, excuse me, after college. Um, uh, mm. in, in college, I was, still, uh, I was still pushing myself more in a direction of uh, art, art music, so classical music and jazz mm -hmm. um, using bits and pieces of different things that I had learned. Um, uh, and then after college, you know, I, I don't actually remember. No, maybe I do. No, oh ma maybe gosh. I do. Let's see. Uh, uh, I started, um, I started working at a, a, an institution in Oakland called stage bridge. Um, uh, oh, w yes. which is a, yeah, a it's, it is a wonderful company. It's a, uh, um, 
primarily what they do is classes for older adults, um, workshops uh, in everything from singing, dancing, storytelling, um, all, all manner of performing arts for uh, people uh, mostly 60 and older. Um, and then they also perform uh, a lot of the time in schools, but also in uh, um, assisted living uh, places. And uh, so I started working there, accompanying. I didn't. Did Stagebridge? Stagebridge did. Did did they develop a play that uh, the uh, that um, ex mime troupe writer uh, John Holden? Well, so, so they they did a couple of things. Yeah, and uh, including. Joan Holden and also uh, Joan Mankin. Um, uh, right, and Arthur Yes, uh, uh, so uh, initially I was accompanying improv classes and then I wrote music for musicals that the students there put on for children, but then the company also uh, commissioned a couple of uh, full-size professional works. Um, uh, one called uh, Counter Attack, uh, and oh yes, that was the one with Ruth uh, uh, with Joe and that's uh, right. And, um, and and my mother was in that in a in a, a oh, she part was. in that. I, um, that. Uh, and I think oh. she was a, a she, might, she actually she might have been a therapist uh, a therapist who who was spiking her tea with vodka. I think it was. I can't can't remember. Something like that. Ah. Um, and then they also commissioned uh, FSM um, by former Mime Trooper right. Joan Holden with music and lyrics by former Mime Trooper Bruce Barthel and myself. And uh, Bruce and I right. split duties on that. Um, and that, that must have been really interesting to be writing a show about the free speech movement. Oh, yeah. That and having the character of your father yes. in the show yeah. that you're uh, working played, on, played by Brady Morales Woolery. That's got to be pretty um, unique. And uh, mm -hmm. yes, it it was really interesting. And uh, I I wrote a song version of his famous speech. Um, yeah, it was a now, great song. Now I re I really enjoyed I doing that, and I I I like a lot of what came out of the show. Um, there were also things about the show that weren't my favorites, but uh, you know it was it was a incredible learning experience. I mean, I I got to dive mm -hmm. deep in with Joan and Bruce and and learn so much about their process, um, uh, which isn't to say that I always agreed with how it was done, but I learned a lot. I learned mm -hmm. a lot, and and it was just uh, incredibly. Uh, uh, in, informative and exciting also. Um, and yeah, we did a couple of uh, workshops of the show, uh, first with no music, then with some music, and then finally we did performances uh, at uh, Berkeley Rep uh, on, on their, um, oh gosh, what's the name of that? Yeah. Is it the it, Rota? It, it has a funny name. Or? I can't remember. I don't remember. I it, it, it's a, it's a. I don't work there enough to know. It's three quarters round. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the that's the 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 regular old Berkeley Rep space. The Rota is the new yeah. space, I think. That's a proscenium stage, and then there's the older thrust. It's a beautiful space. So yeah, this is a a really interestingly shaped stage with with uh, sort of positions of power for actors in unusual places that you wouldn't expect it um because of where the the vomitoriums are and um and, and also just because of the shape and size of the room um so that that was pretty exciting to to put it on there too i think that was the stage that uh passing strange debuted on yeah i think so too yeah it's a beautiful beautiful space so i want to get back to uh, the continuing of your development, uh, moving towards oh, writing yeah. musical okay. theater, which is very, very, uh, eh, eh, <laughs> um, from pretty much everything. 
because of the way you're having to develop uh, 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 character after character. So often when people are writing, you know, just popular songs, they're, you know, oh, I'm in love with this guy and so I, or I broke up with this person or whatever. And they're really trying to stand in for the audience right. in a popular song so that people can relate particularly to that song. Whereas with musical theater, you have to do that to a certain extent, but you're telling somebody yeah. else's story. Yeah. And so the songs have to, and you, you know, every once in a while you'll see a musical where you go, well, that song's just in there. They just stuck a song in, and you can tell the composer or lyricist liked mm. the song, but they, but, and they want it in the show. But, you know, with your work and with, uh, you know, work with people where the story is the most important thing, making sure that every song follows this character or follows the action or the plot uh, sounds like a very particular Yeah, challenge. I mean, part of it for me is that I never got very comfortable at writing songs that were sort of speaking from my heart. Um, uh, uh, you know, find, finding that inspiration from within. That That's just not really how it works for me. Um, so when I started writing lyrics from other people's scripts it was a matter of not not taking not finding the inspiration in myself but but actually seeing what the playwright had been inspired by or what inspiration they were trying to infuse the character with and writing a song with that at its core and and i actually found that a lot easier than trying to say what I was feeling, or trying to invent a scenario um, that that other people would identify with. Um, uh, so, it, and it was also it was a gradual thing because it started with uh, me writing music for someone else's lyrics, and then gradually moving towards wanting to have a say in the lyrics myself, and then eventually, after having practiced it a lot uh and and written a lot of songs that i never showed anybody because they weren't that good um that that i mm -hmm. sort of found the 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 elements either either found the elements that i was missing or i think more accurately got rid of the things that i was putting in that were extraneous and that were actually distracting mm -hmm. um you know l learning to uh try to say things in sentences of three to six words instead of six to 12 words. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah. You know. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a hard thing in playwriting also that, you know, always trying to cut down stuff. How, when, when I'm teaching playwriting and I'm telling people, it's like, if you can do two things with the sentence, yeah. do the two things, you know, if you can add an action. So that's, that's, either an addition to that or even if it's a distraction to that thing, the thing that somebody would do, the more you can yeah, do yeah. compactly. Well, there was a, a, a statement uh, that I picked is, up is, from uh, one of the writers of the Avengers movies, actually, um, uh, that uh, mm. it's, he, he was trying to make every scene do more than one thing, which is almost exactly what you just said. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so in a, a show that I'm working with, uh, excuse me, a show that I'm working on right now with uh, another playwright, um, uh, Stephen Hess, uh, we're, we're doing that. We're trying to make every scene do more than one thing so that the entire story moves forward very quickly and, uh, and, and the whole thing can be just more compact. Um, it's, it's not meant for uh, an, an audience outdoors like the Mime Troop shows are, uh, but it's probably meant for an audience of children, which almost amounts to the same sort of thing, where you want to try to keep, keep the uh, duration of the show uh, down towards an hour, if possible. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that idea, I think, I think you're right, with, like with the Avengers. Um, how you forward each story so you've got you know whatever the general plot is and then you've got a physical story going on with something like well with all plays um how the story is being told how would this story look if they said nothing mm. if it was a silent movie and then on top of that what is the overall how does this particular thing add to the overall story and then 
how do these particular characters, how do we learn more about them that adds to our knowledge of them and tells their individual stories while at the same time augmenting yeah. the overall yeah. story? And I think a lot of people miss that. I mean, I see plays every once in a while where, and films sometimes, where they just do try to do one thing. And it's just like, that's all that happened in the scene. And you're like, without that scene, I wouldn't have necessarily missed enough. That yeah. whole scene could have been one sentence. If you're telling three different stories, if you're showing, having the background music and, and, you know, like if it's a musical, a song, all of these different things that make it a much more like the theater in San Francisco that was called mm. Thick Description. It is a thick description. Um, and that's the challenge is to try to keep all of those levels in your head at the same time so that every new thing that comes along refers to or echoes something that's happened or sets yeah. something up that's going to happen later yeah. For, yeah. for every character. Yeah, so there's a rich a rich tapestry uh, so, that you're you're puzzling your way through. Yeah, yeah, and it and then you know you can like you were saying, go overboard with it, and get to the point where like every line is a freaking right. Easter egg to something else, and you know and it's ooh it's so clever but then you're 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 just patting yourself on the back and and you're showing your cleverness and what you want is so the audience. To ultimately, for me at least, to not even really notice the writing to a certain extent. It's what the characters yeah, I, had to ideally say. Yeah, ideally we're listening to, in a musical theater song, we're listening to the voice of the characters, not the voice of the writers. Um, and, and I, you know, I think yeah. different, uh, different lyricists accomplish that with different degrees of success. Um, and, and even from song to song, some some of them will be more so than others. Yeah. Yeah, in the same musical. Yeah. Uh, so so now uh, with the mime troupe, when did you first uh, kind of become aware? Ah, uh, let's see. I was pretty young. Um, well, okay. I I know that I saw the show eating it. Uh, that my cousin. Uh, Jeremy Mage was in the band for, um, mm -hmm. uh, right. but I, I almost certainly had at least heard of the troupe before then, um, because my my parents mm -hmm. did a lot of uh, telling me of of the the tales of the '60s, um, and and they had been fans of the troupe since early on, um, mm -hmm. since since before yeah, it was great. what it is now. Um, but I, I don't know if they took me to shows prior to Jeremy being involved. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure. I don't, I don't remember. Uh, but I, I, know, I know that at that point, I saw it. And at that point, although I wasn't, I, I don't remember um, being interested in it on an acting level. I was interested in it on a musical level. Uh, and and so uh, mm -hmm. later, it was it was a number of years later um, that uh, I think Jeremy put the troop in touch with me, uh, and that's that's how I uh, came on board on a couple of shows a long time ago now. Um, yeah, did you did you re did you? Come I, in I as was a, a sub for a couple of dates uh, on. Yeah. Um, uh, Godfellas, on God on Godfellas, and and then mm. the year after that, uh, I did the whole tour. Uh, what was that show? Mm -hmm. Now I don't remember. I should have a list I, in front I should, of me. I, I should be able remember. to remember it. There. I'm sure it was wonderful. Yeah. After oh God oh, uh, it was yeah, no, it was making a killing. Red State. It was make, making a killing. Oh, making and a killing. That was that oh, was yeah. a lot of fun, but I was oh. I was very young. I mean, I wasn't very very young, but I was pretty young, and I I didn't uh, quite know how to work, how to you know how to how to make what do you mean my priority the job rather than make my priority you know trying to be as comfortable as possible while the job gets done. Um, or something, something like mm. that. I'm not mm. sure if that's, that's the best way to put it, but, but you know, you yeah. just you learn how to work. No, right? I, I understand. Um, uh, 
but that was that was right that was like 12 years ago or something like that uh and then there were a number of years after that that i didn't work with the troop except uh, i did i did come in and assist valina with uh the uh the workshop you mentioned the uh song is monologue workshop and um and i i think i came in and played yeah. music for a couple of holiday parties or something like that uh, <laughs> uh but then uh it, it wasn't until freedom land that i came on board again and i've been doing it ever since and in the meantime when you were you know with us and then not with us and you were doing other gigs working at um other yeah. theater companies and and yeah i was doing a post. lot of yeah. children's theater um and uh and and learning how to work as an educator uh as well as a musician um mm. Uh, and and then bit by bit also doing uh, some some work with with uh, adults either you know performances with casts of adults or uh, in a couple of cases writing some things so I wrote music for uh, an early production of um, I think at the time it was called a man his hat and his wife and I think it it may be now called the hat maker's wife. I, I don't remember exactly, which is by, uh, Lauren mm, Yee, mm -hmm. um, uh, who has, has mm -hmm. gone on to amazing success. She's having just an incredible, uh, flourishing of her career. It seems. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, who else was on that, uh, production? Uh, uh, Ugo, uh, that's right. Oh, Ugo Carbajal Ugo is on, in that production doing some really kind of fantastic physical stuff where he made himself appear to float up into the air uh, via, wow. uh, you know, um, uh, impressive, impressive calisthenics, essentially, right? He would be putting his weight in one place huh. while making it appear that his weight was somewhere else. Um, in order to appear to be floating up off of the stage uh so that, that was pretty interesting um uh, so yeah I, I i created some music for wow. that production um and uh but but i still i still wasn't writing lyrics uh for theater i i you know i wrote a little bit of lyrics pop pop song type of lyrics in uh in high school and college uh, and then kind of set lyrics aside for a long time because I didn't feel, I didn't, I wasn't that happy with, with the results. Um, uh, and, and then mm -hmm. took it up later after I started writing music for musical theater and not being completely satisfied with what I was being delivered by the lyricist, um, which is not not meant to be an yeah, insult to yeah, the lyricists yeah. that I was working with because they worked very hard and a lot of what they did was fantastic. Um, you know, it's just it's. But still, they, yeah. that you can have that frustration. It's not that they're that they're not good. It's just not you're not necessarily right, right. telling We're, the same yeah. story. And that that little bit of yeah. difference can feel vast when you're trying to create something. Um, essentially, you were talking about you know like children's theater. Uh, which I, you know, people kind of put down children's theater for some reason. It's because um, it doesn't make money. And it's so essential. Right, it doesn't make money. But it's like, if you can hold an audience of little kids, if you can write for, little, write for kids or act for them or write songs, all this stuff that can hold them, then that's such sure. great training for holding an adult audience because it's so much harder and it is so much more essential. The, the, what's going on visually? Do they understand the emotional story? Do they understand all of this stuff that's happening? And then, uh, yeah, sometimes those shows uh, that are written for kids can go on to actually be uh, yeah. major musicals or major plays. And, uh, you know, it is a very specific skill. You know, you look out there and you see all those tiny little faces beaming up at you. And if you lose one of them, you really <laughs> notice because they cry and pee on themselves. Uh, doesn't happen as much with adults, but sometimes. <laughs> uh, so, so now when you came back and you were, uh, 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 I say came back, uh, when we hired you back at the troop yeah. to do keyboards 
for uh, for uh, Freedom Land. So things had things had changed since the last time you'd been there, in terms of personnel and stuff. But what was that experience like that uh, time right. coming in? Again, well, let's kind see. Of what what, what had changed? I mean, the better. the band was the same size, um, but we were now working with fewer actors, uh, and uh, uh, but the uh, the technology available had actually improved, um, and the uh, the construction of the sets seemed to be as ambitious as ever, if not more so. Um, so, I mean, really, the, the troupe is yeah. prob probably more so than almost any other company I, ca I can think of. The troupe is, is a master of doing more with less. Um, not that we want to do more mm. with less, mm -hmm. not that we want to do with less, but uh, uh, we've gotten pretty good at it um, by necessity. Uh, yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of got a. I did a uh, a symposium one time, and they they uh, brought in people, and they had high tech, low tech, right, and then there was medieval tech. <laughs> I spoke on medieval tech. <laughs> You know, I was like, no screens, but it's more than a chair and a thing. And we move this by hand and there's a crank over yeah. here that moves yeah. the set by and stuff. And it was, and it was like, this is what we can afford. But it also allows the audience kind of in a, almost in a Brechtian way to kind of, we can do some stage magic, but at yeah, the same they, time, they can see they all the gears. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, yeah, it doesn't, I mean, in a way it, it makes make it, it more interesting, interesting although but, I think it maybe also sometimes pulls focus, so you have to be really careful about how you do it and, yeah. and all that. But uh, but that's 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 part of the game. Yeah, um, yeah you know, I, I think uh, the big thing that had changed for me, uh, musically speaking, was that uh, in addition to theater stuff in the intervening years, I had also been in a hip hop band, uh, and and doing that forced me mm. to solidify my rhythm um which you know we're just talking about technical mm -hmm. aspects but uh uh that that really brought up my playing quite a lot uh being with that group um uh that's the 808 band what was the name of the group um and uh, uh essentially oh. the 808 band is a uh uh we call it live sound system um uh I don't know if you've ever heard of the sound systems, which were popular in, I think, Jamaica, but also in mm -mm. in New York in the late 70s, especially. Um, so not everybody had a stereo necessarily, uh, and not everybody was going to be able to necessarily go to a club where there was live music. But there was some guy who had a giant sound system built into his van, and he would drive into the neighborhood and just park <laughs> there and open the side of the van and you had a dance party in the street. And so this was the early days of hip hop and also uh, toasting in, in the dance halls yeah. in Jamaica. Um, uh, so the 808 band, and so, uh, excuse me, the, the way that this would be used a lot of the time is you would have a singer and the DJ running the sound system would play that singer's record, but the instrumental track and the singer would come and perform over that. So the 808 band is live oh. sound system, meaning okay. we were a backing band who backed multiple different singers. We, would, we learned the songs of a particular singer or a particular artist and then performed backing up that, that person, um, which was, I mean, that was, it, wow. it was great training. That sounds like great uh, I training. would have, I yeah, absolutely. And I, I would have loved to do it styles. even more um it, it's very difficult to keep it going because it's like a a um it, it is a, it is a business you know it's it's uh e there's for all yeah. bands there is a, a crossover between the art and the business and it's true for the mime troupe too there's a crossover between the art and the business but for a mm -hmm. band who isn't really trying to create their own product but is helping other people to create their products it's even more of a business um and and so it's very very difficult 
and and uh, you know also people have families and and everything uh, and and uh, life goes on and you find other projects right so uh, although playing with the 808 band I think for a whole career would have been extremely valuable to me I'm not really doing so much with them anymore although every now and then we still get together and and do some project um, here or there uh, so yeah that that really. Yeah. It solidified my, really my rhythmic ability and my, my left hand bass playing, which we use a lot in the mime troupe, because in order to save instruments, the pianist a lot of the yeah. time plays the bass part. So that's, that's what that is. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. So, so yeah. I came in for Freedom Land playing keyboards. And then as we've done these last several years of shows, I've gotten the opportunity to use skills in various different ways. There was a season where I took over as the musical director there, uh, there we, last year I wrote lyrics for the first time. Um, and, uh, uh, there was a, a year where, uh, some of the songs didn't really call for piano, but I play a little bit of bass guitar. And so the musical director, Michael Bello, got me to pull out my bass guitar and help me to spruce up some of my skills on that instrument a little bit in order to play that on a couple of the songs. Um, I'm you know, by no means uh, really a bass mm. guitar player, but I have enough, enough to do a little bit. <laughs> So now, yeah. so for Treasure Island, which was last year's show that you um, that you wrote uh, a lyrics on, what was that like for you having to shift? And also, I mean, you've got experience, you had experience by that point working with a playwright and having to kind of, you know, uh, three legged race yeah. through the creative process. Yeah. Um, uh, what was that like for you? Well, you know, you in, in some ways it went pretty smoothly. Not that it was perfectly smooth, but. Um, the the degree to which you and the collective together refine the script in iterations uh, um, makes it both necessary but also valuable to wait to write songs, to not try to write songs early and then hope that they're going to fit in or force them in somehow, but, but to wait until the scene is in such a crystal clear form that we know exactly what the song needs to say. Uh, and, and then that makes it a little easier, actually. I think that makes it a lot easier. Um, uh, b because I, I think we were sort of alluding to this a little bit before. There's there's a puzzle to these shows where where it's you know character arcs interwoven with emotional cues, interwoven with physical comedy, interwoven with the overall arc of the story, um, and and so once. Mm -hmm all of those puzzle pieces and their places are apparent to us, the writers, uh, putting together a song in terms of the structure of the song, that is what dramatic beats are going to happen in the song and in what order and how much you should linger on each one, uh, it, it kind of sorts itself out. I don't have to invent that because we've pieced it together as a collective with with you, the head writer, uh, um, you know, guiding that process. Um, for, for other writers, for other uh, musical theater lyricists, in some cases, that's not how they do it. They, they create the thing themselves, which to me has sort of eluded me, uh, uh, the ability to kind of invent scenarios that will really work as a song um but but for the kind of songs that i'm trying to write that i want to write uh which in in most cases are conversations uh whether they're whether they're realistic conversations or mm -hmm. sort of mm, magicalized conversations 
Um, that's what's most interesting to me uh, because of the same thing, because it's a puzzle, because it, it lets you have things in one part connect to things in another part and, and, and have, uh, you know, in, interesting cross-pollination of musical and lyrical ideas um, as opposed to uh, the structure of a lot of pop songs, which is they keep coming back to the same chorus over and over again because that's the way that you sold the song was by marketing that chorus uh the hook and we still we try to have like hooks hook. in mime troop songs too and i but think it's and that's handled the thing very with, with, differently yeah yeah we want to have a hook generally there's one big hook song um but uh, i think one of the things the idea was you're saying about the puzzle uh that's uh you know when i sometimes when i'm talking about playwriting with people and i talk about um, I have all these different theories and different ones. Yeah. Well, one of them is, is that you're basically solving a problem with writing a play. There is a problem, and you ha there's a precipitating event that has created a problem, and you have to figure out how these characters are going to solve or not solve both the problem in the world but the problem with themselves in solving the problem with the world and the problem with everybody else. And so if you think of it that way, and even when, and when, like with coming with um, just technically, like I might write a scene and then you or, or whoever's the lyricist would go, oh, I've got an idea for a song for this scene. And you come in with the song and I'm like, okay, now I have to change the scene a little bit to make sure that there's, there's stuff that you've said right. better in lyrics that I've already put in words. And so I've got to sometimes cut the uh, lines to make sure to make space for that and rearrange yeah. things a little bit so that nobody misses it. That I might have been riding up to a particular point, and I'm like, "Oh, this is so funny and so amazing the way I've done this." Woo! And then <laughs> you guys come in and you write this a much better song, and it and it tells the story in a really cool way, and it's got the music and everything. And I'm like, "Shoot, yeah. they took my point." <laughs> you know, I remember once uh, in a, mm -hmm. a, a mime troupe show, 1600 Transylvania Avenue. I worked on a scene. And I really liked the scene. It was the opening scene of the show, and it was long, and it had all of these, all of these jokes in it. It was a press conference with George Bush, um, and it had all of this stuff in it. And then Bruce Barthol and Jason so Trebundy bold, came man. along, and they took that entire scene, <laughs> and they made it into, yeah, they stole the whole thing. <laughs> they made the yeah. whole thing into like an opera moment, and it was beautiful, and it was amazing, and a bunch of my stuff was in there. But it was like the way they did it was so good, and I really couldn't s complain. It was like, yeah, and there's some jokes they had to cut, and I was like, right, it doesn't work with the lyrics anymore. Damn. Um, but yeah, so that that solving that problem solving part, like you were saying, putting the puzzle together, is always the. Uh, it, it's both very frustrating for some of the writers. Sometimes we bring like lyricists in who are like, they're right. going to be done in. <laughs> you know, February. They're like, well, just tell me what the works, show's yeah. about and I can write some songs. And it's like, eh, it's not working like that. <laughs> not quite how it works. And then on top of sure. that, having to stay on top of the politics, both throughout the uh, the research process, but also just in the, in the rehearsal, as we're moving along and staying on top of what's going on yeah. in the real world so that the play can reflect it. Now, how has that been for you in terms of, like, some? not every show outside of the mime troupe yeah, is I'm trying to be very actively of activating um, of the audience. Yeah, m mostly yeah. not. Uh, I mean, on, on Treasure Island, for example, the songs, uh, I think a couple of them sort of carried the political, me the, the p political message, but most of them were not really about the political message. Most of the songs mm -hmm. were about the emotional experience of the person who was singing the song, characters who were singing the song. Um, there were a couple of songs that had the political yeah. message in them um, by necessity and, and in order to have the, in order to have the whole thing sort of tie together rather than exist separately. Oh, here's the politics, here's the music, and never the twain shall meet. No, let's try to make them interwoven as much right. as possible. Um, uh, Yeah, I mean, I think that's the way it's always been. In all of my time working with Bruce, it was always, yeah. he would, you know, he's forwarding the emotional story, forwarding the character story, showing the conflict, and then right. he would right. frequently put in a, an anthem of some sort. Right. Something that was this culminating political moment. 
Oh, where, where the finally where the politics and the emotions yeah, and, and, and you know come of course exactly you're often going to try to put like such a thing at the end the because uh, you know just like in baseball they remember the last thing that you did if you 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 know struck struck out in the fifth but then you win the game with a homer they'll remember the yeah. homer but if you lose the game with a strikeout it doesn't matter what you did in the fifth <laughs> yeah then you're the goat. So now you're also uh, a, a collecting yeah. member. You're well, it's one been of a couple. It's been up like two years now. Um, what was that? Yeah, and somehow, in some way, it feels longer than that. <laughs> Not because it's been too long with you around, but because you've been such a oh, well, that's, that's such very an important nice member. Hear. You know, even before you were actually in the collective and you were playing, we kind of thought of you as, as very much part of the family of the company. And then once you came in, you immediately were having such a big impact, you know, which everybody doesn't do. Some people, I, you know, always try to tell people when they enter, there's no such thing as right. being a junior collective member. You're just in the collective. But that still takes, uh, some people take a few years to really right. be, uh, feel like they can speak out and say things. And you jumped right in with ideas and let's do this and let's try this with fundraising. Well, I've got a big mouth. All of this stuff. Oh, well, it wasn't, it wasn't annoying. You're annoying. saying it wasn't annoying. So that's nice. But yeah. uh, I, I, well, I'm, I'm. That's that's very nice to hear. Yeah, I, it wasn't I, annoying. I haven't actually felt that effective, but but uh, you're you're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, yeah. really, it was a it was a good group that we brought in, and and like I said, you already felt like, uh, uh, it was like, well, of course, Daniel, you know, when we were discussing potential collective members. It was like, well, he's been here, he's doing stuff, he's super reliable, you know, he's, he's got a, a really wide breadth of, of kind of a, a library of music within him. He's interested in all of this stuff, and politically, he's, he's right. Uh, right, right. outspoken. There was, you know, not everyone is. There was a little bit of a know, question of outspoken outside of the truth. music style. I, I remember this, that, that I mean, because I, I am a musical theater person. And I like musical theater music, and I would be totally thrilled to make a Mime Troupe show that sounded like a Jerry Herman show. Um, but in fact, that's not really what we're mm -hmm. trying to do usually. We're trying to keep the music more uh, t right. stylistically, musically stylistically, more towards modern pop music. And in fact, trying to absorb new modern ideas... Uh, not not just what was modern in the '60s and '70s, but maybe what's modern now as well. Um, so so that's not necessarily part of my library, but but uh, there's you know you you piece together a bit from here and a bit from there, and it turns into something new, right? Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Like when I think about you know when I first saw the troupe. And, you know, have their very strong rock style, which had just finished, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but they uh, still had a horn section, you know. So there was a big band, yeah. you know, um, Earth, Wind and Fire kind of feel to, you know, uh, average yeah. white band, this big band doing these pop tunes. And then it became more jazz, and then it became more hard rock, then it became a little bit more musical theater once Bruce Barthol uh -huh. um, kind of, he started to expand uh -huh. and take more chances with what he was writing. Right. Um, and right. also that's what theater, musical theater was doing at the time. So I think one of the strengths with the troupe yeah. is because we get to change genre so much, you know, it's like this kind of show versus this. Some shows that have many yeah. songs, some shows that have very few songs and they're all really short. Some songs, sometimes it's the play is right, more Brechtian right. and the songs are just people turn out and sing a song. Yeah. Um, so it always challenges us as writers, as actors, as directors, and as composers to uh, um, kind of uh, tell a, tell a new story on the with the same basic things of the the difficulties and and contradictions of corporate capitalism and racism and institutionalized racism and sexism and transphobia and all of these things that are our critique of yeah. corporate capitalism yeah. Yeah. in a different way well, I, I think time. the troop really <laughs> no. exemplifies uh, something that I got from Stephen Sondheim, uh, which is content dictates form. 
So if the show is about, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. police brutality, that was Freedom Land, that, that fact is going to dictate some of the form of what the show itself takes and, and, and the songs as well. Um, in, in a number of different ways that doesn't it's not a one-to-one -one equation but it it guides the writers uh towards uh um towards creating a show that not only is saying what it's trying to say but also that makes you feel and and experience some of that same thing that that the whole thing is telling the same story that all elements of the show the music the set the costumes the dialogue the characterizations the physicalization of the characters that it's all telling the same story it's a big yeah. challenge yeah that's uh sondheim, sondheim. uh yeah he's 90 um he's 90 and they are doing some sort of tribute 90. concert um that i think we're going to be able to watch online though i haven't i haven't looked yeah. it up to find out what the details are yeah i i, I think i would yeah, I mean, probably I, I, really enjoy watching I it i uh, i think uh raul esparza is the host and and then there's lots of really famous people oh, everybody wow. from uh uh meryl streep to uh, Bernadette Peters, Mandy Patinkin, um, you know, just l incredible roster of, of guests. Well, that's cool. I mean, for Sondheim, having that, you know, uh, one of the things about, about our business, the bit, the mm. just theater, is the ephemeralness of it, you know, most right. shows, right. most shows uh, never get produced at all, period, zilch. And then out of the ones that do, a bunch of them only get produced on a, on yeah. a smaller level. Maybe, you know, dozens of people saw it. And then there's hundreds and thousands and all these different things. But in any yeah. of those situations, a lot of times that show may never get done again. You know, not so with Mind Troop shows, but uh, a, our most successful shows may never get done again. And that's the case at, uh, for, for most of theater. Yeah, and they're not if, videoed. They're just kind of. If you're gone. lucky, there's that a script. moment where that show might have been brilliant and perfect, and if you're lucky, yeah. If you're lucky, like with a musical, as we've talked yeah. about, there's actual that sheet music that's that still exists. <laughs> um, that was one of the reasons that. Yeah, and it's accurate. That yeah. was one of the reasons I did the Mime Troop anthology of plays, at least some of the shows, like Seventeen or whatever it was, so that that was so that it existed. And uh, I know you and I have talked about trying to do that for the music to make sure that we have all of that, uh, yeah. so that our work isn't just gone with the wind, you know. Um, so is there uh, else I don't know, maybe not in this conversation. I'd love to do this up? again, though. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a, a number of different conversations we could have. Uh, cool. uh, this was this was largely about sort of my personal development as an artist, but uh, I'd I'd love to just talk politics or uh, whatever whatever else you thought of. Yeah, well, I'm, um, we're probably going to do a few mm -hmm, of these mm -hmm. and do you know some for play creation, you know. But to do it this way rather than a Zoom meeting. Sounds good. And uh, yeah, and other times we could just sit around and talk politics. Cool. So anyway, that was the Mimecast with uh, writer, composer, lyricist, musician, collective member, and so many other things, Daniel Savio. And uh, I hope you guys liked it. And hopefully we'll uh, have a few more of these with other collective members and workshoppers and ex-members uh, and veterans and everybody who's ever been around the troops so you get a chance to get to know them a little better. Thanks a lot for listening. See you next time. Power to the people down there.